Hello. What's up, buddy? How you doing? Good. How are you? I am good. What's happening? Um, well, not much. Stuck at home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you for doing this. Um, all right, so yeah, let's get right into it. So I got to start off with when did you get into sports casting? You know, I think as a kid, I was, I was a bit of a talker, but I love to play. And I didn't really get into it until I started my college career at the College of William and Mary in Virginia. And I played baseball there and I got hurt and I was pretty bad too. And I transferred to Boston College. And as soon as I got on campus at Boston College, I went to the student radio station and I read for the program director. And he said, hey, that's pretty good. You've never done this before? And I said, no. And that was kind of the, the start of it. And then I would do sports updates and some news and a talk show. Um, and that was sort of how it began. So how did your time at Boston College help shape you into the broadcaster you are today? Well. While I was at BC, I think as much as anything, there were two other guys I was there with. One was Bob Washusen. Bob is an ESPN play-by-play -play guy uh, for college football and college basketball. And he's also the radio voice for the New York Jets. And then the other guy that was part of our group is Joe Tessitore, who's the Monday Night Football TV play-by-play -play guy. So the three of us were there at the same time. And... We just loved sports and we loved broadcasting and we loved talking about sports. So that was really, it was, you know, that there's another a guy named John Risch who did a bunch of work for the Red Sox radio. And I think that that, that as much as anything, but any time at WZBC at Boston College, we could get a chance to do some stuff on the air we did. So what was it like um, now looking back at that? And, uh, you know, seeing those guys going on to have success, you coming on to have big success, um, just what's, what goes through your mind when you think about that experience? Right. You know, it's, I don't, I know what you're asking. And I, and I think the thing that's funny is I, I'm not struck all the time about it, but in moments I sit there and think to myself, wow, if you could have gone back and told us then what we'd be doing now, I think all of us would have been like, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> and I think, we, I think we would have been pretty, pretty surprised. We, we've been, look, I can just, speaking for me, I've been really lucky in terms of right place at the right time. Bob helped me get my first job in Florida. He's the person that got me to the radio station where the Marlins did their games. And eventually I got a chance to be a Marlins broadcaster I've stayed close with those guys. So it's neat to sit in a moment, I, more than anything, because we never see each other. We never see each other because we all do the same thing. It's me sitting down to watch a Monday Night Football game. It's me watching a college football game and watching Bob or Joe and saying, wow, we were all at BC together. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so what was your first big chance in broadcasting? I think it depends on how you look at it, but I would say it's it's really twofold. It would be, I was doing talk radio in Miami. I was I would go to games and do games into a tape recorder in an empty booth at the Marlins ballpark. I gave the tape out, and on that, um, it was through a friend of mine, Dan Levitard. His friend, Dan, Dan show, so we're longtime friends, but his friend was doing minor league baseball, the team, the, the ownership group owned another team. They offered me the job. And while I was putting a tape together and doing all of that, I was talking to the Marlins broadcast director. So in 1996, I went and did the Boise Hawks. And I did play-by-play -play as the number two radio guy with my partner, Rob Simpson. And then when I came back for the 97 season, the Marlins were changing their broadcast group, and I got to be part of it. So it was sort of that, you know, that period of time where I went from doing games into an empty broadcast booth in a tape recorder and by you know that was 95 and by 97 I was actually doing the Marlins games. So and when you were doing the Marlins games you actually got to witness uh, the 2002 season which was or 2003 sorry where yep. they were able to win the World Series what was it like being able to witness that? It was great in fact I got to see Len and I were there Len Casper and I were there 
you know, for for the 2003 World Series, my first year in 97, the Marlins won it all as well. So I got two World Series rings uh, from that, which was pretty, pretty spectacular. And they were very different. The 97 team went out and spent a ton of money on free agents. The 03 team was kind of the young kids that had been acquired in the fire sale and they were together for a while, and the, the, the 03 team was kind of a Cinderella run, but it was it was yeah. a talented group, there's no doubt. Yeah, and then so after that you went to the Atlanta Braves, and what was your time like there, and what was some of your favorite memories from it? Yeah, it was neat. I, I got to, to be around a, a Hall of Fame manager and Bobby Cox and, and Hall of Famers Tom Glavin and John Smoltz and Chipper Jones. And they didn't make the playoffs the three years that I was there, but it was just fun. They had a good group of guys. It was my, you know, my chance to really get, I had done TV the two prior years with ESPN, but I really got a chance to, to sharpen my skills on the TV side. And, and it was fun. I had, a, I had a really good time with it. So while you're a sportscaster, you get to create memories for so many other different people that are just watching like, I got interviewed by Joey Danya um, on KWQC, a local radio station, I mean, a local TV station in Iowa. And right. he grew up listening to you, and some <laughs> of his, he remembers listening to you, and you inspired him, too. Um, That's cool. So what's it like to know that you were able to have as big of an impact as that on so many people? It makes me feel old. It, I mean... <laughs> With the, so the beginning of our conversation off the air is you telling me I grew up listening to Len Casper. And my first <laughs> thought, because I don't think of myself as being old, even though I'm old, you tell me that. And the first thing I want to do is call Len and say, he said he grew up listening to you. You're a thousand years old. <laughs> um, so I, uh, and look, when you, when I remember listening to Harry Callis and Vince Scully and, and Ernie Harwell and meeting those guys and how it felt. And when you get past the point, they're like, look, we're all aging and we get older. And I've had more than a couple of people say, I grew up listening to you or hearing you. It's an honor. It's an absolute thrill. I'll tell you this. As it's connected to that, I get to call the Major League Baseball All-Star Game. I've done it every year on the radio nationally since 2010. And my memory as a kid is going to sleepaway camp when I was your age and listening to that game on the radio and listening to Vince Scully call it and Ernie Harwell call it. And now it's me. And so I, you can't run away from what a thrill and an honor it is and yeah when, when somebody says that I I'm I'm so honored by it it's a it's a wonderful compliment and I and I don't ever want to dismiss the connection that the people on the other end of the radio or the TV feel yeah and from this job you get to meet um, so many you know baseball legends and commentators right. who are legends you know, do you ever just sit back and think, just wow, and what are some of your favorite memories with them? You know what's funny is that for the most part, you get into this space where you're not that phased by it. I think at a certain point, and yet, like here, you could probably relate to this. So a good example would be, I've talked with Mike Trout. I've talked with Christian Yelich, with Cody Bellinger. I covered the Phillies the whole time when the Phillies were really good, made the playoffs yeah. five straight years um, in the late 2000s and won it all in 2008. But I was in the Phillies clubhouse one day, probably, I don't know, six, seven years ago, and Gary Maddox, who was a really good gold glove center fielder on the 80 Phillies team. That was a team that won the World Series. That was my favorite team of all time. Gary was not a great player. He was a very good player. He was an elite defensive player. But in that moment, with Gary Maddox standing there, even as a 40-year-old, I was like, oh, my gosh, that's Gary Maddox. <laughs> as opposed to on a day-in, day-out basis. The one other guy that falls out of that that, that is – you know, to what you're talking about. I, I wish I could explain why, but I know I'm not alone. 
a couple years ago for Jackie Robinson Day, we were at Dodger Stadium, and we had Sandy Koufax in the booth. Oh. And there's just something about Sandy Koufax, the way he carries himself. There's a presence. You feel like you're in the presence of royalty. And he, he's just, and he's so kind and gentle and sweet. But it's one of the rare times that I've gotten to this stage of my career when I've been around someone and been a little, a little nervous. So those are a couple of examples. Um, so throughout your career, you're able to see some great moments. And I actually got to call a buzzer beater full court, 0 0.6 seconds to go as the team wow. I've been covering all year. And I was able to get the call, but like my emotions were taken over. Does that happen to you? Or if it, if you're able to control it, how, just how do you do that? I think that, you know, it, it, it really depends. I, there have been times when my emotions have gotten the best of me and I haven't loved the call. There have been times when my emotions have gotten the best of me and I really liked the call. There have been times when I probably controlled them a little bit better and I liked it. And there are times when I've controlled them a little bit better and I thought it was okay. So it kind of runs the gamut. In, you know, those moments are, you know, the, you're going to get a chance to do this. You're, you're not going to call a ton of, you know, full court buzzer beaters in your <laughs> entire life. You know, you're just yeah. not. So you, you got to... I would say you, you have to be kind to yourself because you're, you're never going to be perfect. And the one thing that I'll tell you as far as, you know, if you ever listen back to your stuff, somebody once told me to wait like two weeks so that you're not sitting there watching or listening like, oh, this is where I said this. That you try to do it at least a little more objectively that you do it a little bit more like a viewer would, like a listener would. Um, yeah. But those moments are special. You get excited and, and you just, you go with it. Um, so back to your like timeline in your career, um, after Atlanta, you were hired by ESPN as a commentator. What was going through your head when they told you that you got the job and, you know, hey, I'm working at ESPN? Yeah, it's 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 wild. I, I think, you know, the, it's, it's that – I don't know that there was a singular moment, but being in it, and I think even still that, that you're part of it, it's uh, – look – ESPN, ESPN has transformed sports as we watch them, yeah. as we as we know it, and the way people consume sports, and it continues to evolve. And I've gotten a chance to be in the middle of it and be a part of it. But the, so the first time I went there was two thousand, end of two thousand and four, start of two thousand and five, and I've been working there since. But then I was there for two straight years. And then went to the Braves seven, eight, nine, and I would do b basketball and a tiny bit of baseball those years. Um, and then I came back full time in two thousand and ten. Yeah, and then so, uh, what are some of your favorite moments that you have been able to witness as a broadcaster? So, I, I mean, again, I wasn't doing play by play, but the ninety seven World Series at Garantaria in the eleventh inning. I think it was the eleventh inning of Game Seven. Craig Council scored the winning run. To be there for that was amazing. The 2003 World Series, for me as a call, it was neat to be able to... I got to call Game 4, Alex Gonzalez in extra innings hit a walk-off homer. And they put it on a bottle opener and sold it at Bed Bath & Beyond. They put the call on that. And that was kind of <laughs> cool. Um, I've gotten a call... I got to call Roy Halladay's no-hitter in the playoffs in 2010. Yes. There have only been two no-hitters in the history of the postseason, yeah. and I got to call one of them, and that's that's pretty neat. Jake Arrieta's no-hitter on Sunday Night Baseball, I got to call. Um, A.J. Burnett's no-hitter with the Marlins. Yeah, they're, they're, those, would be, those would be some of them. Certainly, you know, it, it, it sounds like you're a Cubs fan, so for Die the – uh, for 2003, when the Marlins came back to beat the Cubs in that series, was a big uh, was a big moment as well. Yeah, and so um, I just I remember watching that call on Sunday Night Baseball um, with Arietta. I still watch it multiple yeah. times a year. And um, so you also got to call. I saw Derek Jeter's walk off in I his did, final right. game at Yankee Stadium. 
Just what was that moment like? Because few people so, got to witness that. You did your research. That's good. You know what was really funny about that? So the funniest thing about that is the way it happens as a broadcaster. There's only one reason we're broadcasting that game, okay? Yeah. Like, the only reason you're broadcasting that game is because it's Derek Jeter's final game at Yankee Stadium. And then that's the only reason you're there. And then the games close, and then it gets to the late stages, and as the dominoes are clicking, you're sitting there saying to yourself, are, are we serious? Am I really going to... We're really, he's really going to get a chance to win the game in his final home. It was amazing that it's set up that way. I, mean, I have goosebumps right now thinking about it. And I'm not a Yankee fan, but just, gosh, the way that played out was absolutely incredible in his final game. The odds that it would come down to Derek Jeter and... I mean, I was just I was just broadcasting with a smile on my face just because there was as the whole thing was leading up to it, I was kind of like, holy cow, this is this really happening? This is really happening. OK, so, yeah, um, I remember like Jilly and Jimmy Fallon uh, a couple days after that I was interviewing Derek Jeter and he was at the game and he's just like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. And he recalled that I saw it. <laughs> I saw it. It was hysterical. Yeah. yeah, Jimmy Fallon, he couldn't spit it out. He was just, yeah, he was he was like a like a yeah little kid. It was great. Um, so just what was it like? You've been so past couple decades. You've been calling baseball games. You've been a yep. big part of baseball as well. What's it been like to see baseball? It's transformed um, over yeah. the past few years and like past ten years. Um, what do you think the biggest change to the game now is? So right now, it's it's a combo of things. I think, you know, the game is getting, is longer. Mm -hmm. The pace is slower, so there's more time between pitches, and there's more time between the ball being put in play. So there's just less action. I think the players are better than they've ever been. They're more talented than they've ever been. But the introduction of analytics means that I think that almost on almost every play, the pitchers and the hitters are contemplating so much, they feel like they have some of the answers to the test mm -hmm. that it slows the pace down and it puts a little more emphasis on this single pitch is very important and then this single pitch is very important. So I think that the fact that it's slowed down there's so much reliance on the home run ball, but make no mistake, the players are phenomenal. They're not, you know, no matter what, anybody that tries to tell you the players aren't as good or not as fundamentally, they're great. But where we are at this moment, it's, it's probably not good for the growth of the sport. I mean, I should be interviewing you about how do we get kids your age more entertained because my suspicion would be I think that if the, if the ball was in play more frequently, if the game took two and a half hours and there weren't as many swings and misses and the ball was always being hit, um, I think more people your age would like it. I think. Maybe I'm wrong. That and also more bat flips. <laughs> that is fun. <laughs> well, you got to watch Korea baseball then because yes. I'm going to be broadcasting uh, the KBO starting at uh, 530 on Friday morning, 530 Eastern. Yeah, I've actually been watching that. It's been pretty interesting. You know, it's still baseball, but it's also so different over there. Very different. And it's going to be different for you, too, because you're going to be calling it from home. It's going to be yeah. early in the morning. Different yeah. side of the world That's is right. where the game is. What's, you know, how are you preparing for this game? And what have you heard it's been like um, broadcasting from halfway around the world? So I've done it before. In 2006, I did the World Baseball Classic. I did the I did the Orlando bracket with Venezuela, Australia, Italy. Can't remember who the other team was, but I did that live in Orlando. But then I also did the Far East on remote from Bristol in Connecticut. Um, I've called a couple of games on remote, but this will be challenging. There's a little delay from an audio standpoint. You know, the fact that you're not right next to your partner and the body language 
makes it a little more challenging. At this point, because I've been in Major League Baseball for so long, there are just things that I see and recognize and know, and it just goes in here and to come out, and I don't have to think about it, and I don't have that luxury with these players. I have to think about pronouncing the names, you know, the who the player is, uh, all that type of stuff. So, you know, mistakes are going to be made, and also off a monitor, it's harder to tell whether a ball's going to be fair or foul, whether a ball's going to be, you know, leave the park, et cetera. So... Yeah, I'm going to make mistakes, but it'll be fun. It's baseball. What are you most excited about um, the game, being able to call those? I, I think it's just a little bit of everything. I think it's it's getting a chance to just talk baseball, have some fun. I mean, this is what I do, and I've been, I've been missing it. You know, you mentioned Len Casper, or I mentioned him, but... Yeah. Yeah, this is what we do. We, we're just, we're, you know, we talk a good amount about how I miss it. I miss just doing it. So um, I, I, there's probably too many things to list individually. It's just the general thing that on a day-in, day-out basis, I love calling baseball. Um, so I asked Len this question. Um, I want to know, what advice would you give to young sportscasters like me or sportscasters that are just getting into the game? Get as many reps as you can. If you want to be on the air, go call game. So whatever you can do to do that. Um, and then, you know, look, it takes some time at, for you to sort of find your style. If there's one thing that I would is you want to get repetitions and just keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And then the part that hopefully will come naturally is try not to sound the way you think a broadcaster should yeah. sound. Baseball broadcasters at times are especially guilty of it. It's like we all start into it thinking we're supposed to sound like a 65-year-old guy. And I would just encourage you to do you, um, mm -hmm. to just speak the way you speak. If there are jokes or, you know, your sense of humor that makes your friends giggle, your parents giggle, your brothers and sisters giggle, do that. And I can just tell you this. You're doing great so far, bud. Thank you. Well, I do have one more question here, and it's the island question. So what are the three things you would bring with you uh, on a deserted island? Wow, three things that I would bring with me on a deserted island. So can I have my phone? No, I won't take my phone. I'm, I'll take uh, Starbucks, uh, iced coffee, <laughs> um... Black, no sugar, no cream. Um, I'd say a good book and some music. Okay. So that's all I got. Thank you for doing this. It was really My a blast. Book. You were awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. It's an honor being in, well, being able to talk to you too. Thank you for that. All right. See you, bud. Bye.